What's up, guys? Welcome into Good Morning Lambo. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. Find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. Email us, Packers Total Access at gmail.com. Text us, 865-658-5824. Join alongside Jacob in Wisconsin. Here to talk a little Packers this morning. Hope everybody's having an awesome Sunday morning. Sir, how are you today? I'm good, man. I'm ready to go. A little sleepy. It's a little rainy here. It's like the perfect sleeping morning, but uh, I'm good to go. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Nothing wrong with sleeping on a dreary day out here. We're looking at, I think, 68 degrees and sunny today. So I'm I'm going to get out here and plant some uh, plant some trees and mow the lawn. And, yeah. Stay work out, work out the redneck way. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm excited about that. It should be a beautiful day. But let's give a shout out to everybody in the chat. We got Greg in the house. Chris in. We got. John or Josh uh, Van Lanningham sounds like a very important human being there, Jacob, doesn't it, man? If your um, name's Van anything, you're you're, you're very important. Yes, we got Dave James. Let's see, we got Prince in the house. Do you rant? Pete M in the house. Reef, what's up, Reef? Good to see you, buddy. And uh, Mark Zambito checking in. So yesterday, kind of cool. I seen Tim retweeted this. Tim may join us in a minute. Where he's either in the clink or he overslept. One of the two. So Tim's having a little trouble waking up. Good morning. <laughs> That's exactly right. He actually tweeted something that uh, he may have tweeted it yesterday, and I just seen it today. But yesterday was actually the anniversary of the signing of Reggie White and Green Bay back in 1993. So uh, just got a quick little clip from the presser, that type of thing. Let's hit that real quick, Jay. Great pride to introduce the newest member of the Green and Gold, Reggie White. Go ahead and shoot your questions. <laughs> Reggie White, Green Bay. Well, you know, uh, I was really impressed when I came up here the first time. I, I told Coach Holmgren uh, when we sat in and met uh, the first time, I said man, Green Bay was the farthest thing from my mind. But I was really impressed with the coaching staff, with the whole organization, and with the direction the team is going. I think they, they have a total commitment to winning. The situation came down where I had to feel peace about where I wanted to be. No one man, no one player in football can, can take you to this championship. It's a team sport, and he knows that. And Ron and, and I, we're all committed to surrounding and getting the best players we have on this football team and continuing to do that so we can all win that championship together. Should I hold this up? Or? Yeah, stay yeah, away from I'll, I'll do him a favor. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So, again, Reggie Wyatt signing, I think it was yesterday, was the anniversary, all the way back to 1993. Um, I guess I was, what, 11 years old when that happened. Obviously, I was not a Packers fan at the time. At that time, I was probably rooting for the Steelers with my brother, but was more of a – a college football fan and uh, was really, really deep into baseball. So obviously became a Packer fan in 03. Um, Reggie White, though, do you remember the impact he had as a young child, Jacob? First of all, how old were you when Reggie White signed in 1993? I would have been five years old, and I actually do remember it happening because uh, I remember my dad um, told me about Reggie White, and I knew who he was because we used to watch. We I, I was a big football fan since I can remember, and I remember playing against him. And I knew who Randall Cunningham was at the time, too. And he was one of my favorite players that came uh, out of Philly. So I knew who he was. I didn't know how great he was, obviously. I think it was more around like a couple years after that, 95, 96, that Super Bowl year is when I have vivid memories of watching him play. Um, mm -hmm. But I remember him signing and my dad being jacked. And I'm just like, oh, okay, cool. All right. <laughs> and then I remember yeah. also uh, having a Reggie White bar. I had tons of them uh, in my uh, room that i was supposed to just save for all times and i'd end up eating them after they're like a few years old and i'd be like i wish i didn't do that <laughs> yeah we wouldn't recommend that i'm sure there's a shelf life on those things so um, i know we got tim joining us now live in green bay tim you were the reason i seen this man i know you had tweeted it out but uh, look at oh, we got us a new ball cab i think from the tent sale possibly mm -hmm. i would imagine but um obviously you tweeted that out about reggie white man the goat um what do you think? Uh, first of all, how old were you? Do you remember the signing of Reggie Watt? Oh, man, 93. I would have been, yeah, like 12, something mm -hmm. like that, 12 and a half, something. Um, I do remember that, and I remember a lot of my uh, uncles and my dad being excited about it. And, um, 
you know, I put on that tweet too, you know, it's like God called Reggie to Green Bay, you know, he, he sent him, he sent him here and the rest is history. You know, he, he literally, he was the guy, he could have went anywhere. And, uh, you know, Green Bay might as well have been Siberia to most people in the, the NFL at the time. Right. And, um, you know, so for him to come here kind of just, you know, really, really just set everything in motion. You know, we had a lot of pieces in play already, but uh, the addition of Reggie White was just huge. And um, it was an exciting time to be a Packer fan for sure. And, uh, you know, success in the Super Bowl was just a few short years away after that moment. So uh, uh, God bless Reggie White, man. A legend, absolute legend. And I like what you said, definitely the GOAT. I, I still think, in my opinion, I mean, there's a few other names up there that come to mind, but Reggie White's the greatest defensive player of all time. I'm sorry. My and guy. his prime, man, it's hard to argue with that. There's yep. no, you know, I think an argument can be made for like the entire career because those last few years, you know, in Carolina and things. But um, yeah, I'm with you, man. When he was at his peak, whew. It was hard to beat Reggie White. A hump move. I remember this one. Oh my gosh. I'll hump never forget. It's the one where he's playing against the Vikings. And they actually they sent for some reason like Chris Carter, Randy Moss out to try to block him. <laughs> he just threw he literally grabbed him with one arm and threw him at Randall Cunningham. And Randall Cunningham, he got the sack by throwing yeah. a receiver. It was John, like John Baden's announcing it. He's like, I've never seen that before. He threw <laughs> it out of him. <laughs> and boom, boom, he just throws him. Boom. The way that Cunningham has to stagger backwards as the body's thrown at him, he's like, who the hell was that? It's like, what, where did that come from? Yeah. You was, talk uh, about one of the most, like, peaceful men on earth, a God-fearing minister off the football field. But, man, you put the helmet and pads, <laughs> played that game pretty violently, guys. <laughs> I'll tell you. No doubt about it. Um that's the other thing, too. If you guys haven't seen Minister of Defense, um, the documentary that dropped, man, what a phenomenal documentary. A um, lot of lot of God in it, a lot of religion in it. I say religion because, you know, I don't throw that term around lightly. Um, I'm not a religious person. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Reggie on the backside, um, after his preaching days and everything, and before he passed away, really started digging into – some of the older scripture and just without getting too deep into the weeds here, you need to go watch the documentary. Um, it was interesting to see how people turned on him when he started digging a little deeper and, and learning things that maybe he had been misled on. throughout his life. And um, it was just a, a really good documentary to kind of see how he cut his own path there at the end. And uh, I think he found a lot of peace. I think that's someone too, that, genuinely cared about people and um got greatly rewarded for it after he left this world i believe that with everything in me so just an amazing man no doubt about it um i love the contract that you pulled up to jacob that's wild to think that he was the top free agent four years 17 million <laughs> and that's when the big bucks start rolling in right. and people at the time were like whoa what are y'all doing man these guys are getting paid way too much money what are we thinking Hey, a dollar was worth uh, closer to a dollar back then, though. Yeah. Oh. I'd love to see gas prices in 93. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you so, would. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah Tim, I think Tim hit the nail on the head. I'm not religious. I'm a Christian. I, yeah. I would completely agree with that, my friend. So, um, all right. Let's see uh, what else we can get into here. Jacob, you sent some good stuff over. Before we get to that topic that you sent, that article, um, which I thought was fascinating. I really did. Um I want to give a quick shout out to Dane Stromstad um, in the Patreon group. He actually asked me this question in there. said, how many of Jordan Love's contract escalators did he hit and which ones? And, you know, like Jacob, we were talking offline. Like I didn't even know. I didn't know the answer to this. And when I pulled this tweet, um, it's the first time I had ever seen it, which is really interesting. So Albert Breer tweeted this out. He said, Packers uh, quarterback Jordan Love's one-year extension. So this was back when he signed it, back in May of 2023. Said uh, 8.7 million signing bonus, right? So you converted a bunch of uh, salary to signing bonus, essentially. Not converted, but, you know, the, the deal he was on wasn't going to get paid near as much guaranteed money, right? So they guaranteed a lot on the front side. You had a $1 million base salary for 2023, fully guaranteed. $5.5 million base for 2024 fully guaranteed, obviously the year we're in right now, $9 million in escalators based on the 23 performance. 
and 500,000 in 24 workout bonus. All right. So a total guarantee was 15.3 million with a max of 24.8. Now here's where it gets interesting. I had never seen these numbers. And like Jacob had pointed out, um, hopefully we can read it here. It is a little, a little bit smaller font here on Streamyard, but um, this is essentially the escalators. And I had never seen them in detail or at least didn't pay much attention to it. Uh, $500,000 for playing 65% oh, no, of no. the offensive snaps. <laughs> No, nope. all the numbers. It's retired. It's retired. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's retired. <laughs> let, me ex- let me explain something to you boys. If I want to hear the 65%. 65%. 65%. <laughs> that's what we- I will play the 65%. <laughs> so $1 million for making the Pro Bowl. So obviously he did not make the Pro Bowl, right? But he did play 65% of the offense with snaps. Uh, $500,000 for 65% playing time and the playoffs. $500,000 for 65% of playing time and one playoff win. So he obviously hit both of those as well, right, for another milli. Um, $1 million for 65% of the playing time and win a conference title, 65% of the time and win the Super Bowl. So obviously missed on those $2 million bonuses there. So picked up another milli there with the playoff win and the playoff playing time, right? Um, so you move on to the next set of escalator. It was uh, $500,000 for 65% of the playing time and top 10 in passer rating. I'm not sure if he finished top 10 in passer rating. I kind of feel like he did, but I could be wrong there because the first half of the season was pretty rough. Um, $500,000 for 65% of the playing time and top 10 in completion percentage. Um, I want to say he was around 15th or 16th in completion percentage, if I remember correctly. Um, $500,000 top 10 in passing touchdowns. He was second. And passing touchdown, so obviously he hit that. Five hundred thousand dollars for top ten in passing yards. I'm pretty sure he was in the top five in passing yards, if I remember yeah. correctly. Definitely top ten. Definitely top 10. Um, and then uh, so there you hit what three of those four, I believe it was, if I remember correctly. So that's another one point five million. Uh, Love gets one million if sixty five percent of the playing time a team wins ten games or uh, or more. I'm sure I'm I'm assuming is what that meant. 65%. 65 percent. 65 percent. We ended up winning what nine or nine games? Am I thinking right, guys? So just slightly missed that one. Unless the 10 includes playoffs. I don't know. It doesn't really feel like it does there. Um 65 percent playing time and team goes to the playoffs, or 65 percent of the playing time and top 10 in passer rating and touchdown passes. So 65 percent playing time and the team goes to the playoffs. He hit, right? So He got one of those three, which I would assume get him another million. Um, And then, of course, the last set of escalators for Jordan Love's contract in 2023 was $500,000 for 65% playing time and top 16. Did I say 16? Am I seeing that right, guys? Yes. In passer rating. So I think he hit that one. Um, $500,000, 65% playing time and top 16 in completion percentage. Uh, five hundred thousand dollars, sixty-five percent playing time, and top sixteen in passing yards. Definitely hit that one, and then five hundred thousand dollars for sixty-five percent playing time and top sixteen in passing. I don't know what that means. Maybe attempts, but uh, anyway, capped after hitting three or four markers at one and a half million. The max would be one and a half million. So you can see he hit on dang near all of his escalators, right? Other than the conference title one and I believe the passer rating ones. So. Um, Pretty cool that uh, he kind of maximized on that. And, again, I like how Green Bay structured that deal. They they said, you know what, we want you here for at least two more years. Let's kind of see if this works for both of us. Let's take that base salary, trim it down to right at a million, and give you like $8 million in your pocket with a signing bonus. And, oh, by the way, if you ball out, you're going to be able to make a bunch of more money here too. So I thought that was just a win-win deal for everyone. I love that Jordan Love kind of, I don't know, kind of bet on himself there too, guys, you know. But, Jacob, again, this is the first time we ever seeing this. Um, any comments on that there? Yeah, I mean, uh, congrats to Jordan for making that money. At the same time, I honestly don't understand why, if I'm a player and I'm confident in my abilities, I would ask for a structured contract every year like this. I'd be like, all right, give me a base salary of $3 million, and then structure me like $10 million in incentives and then just tell me what they are. And I, I just feel like that I'd. I, I don't know. At, in the long run, if you are um, a guy that can stay healthy and all that kind of stuff, you know, it's which is a big right. if. But if I'm a coach or, a, or I'm sorry, a GM, 
I look at this on paper and I'm like, I know that, you know, it's kind of like the casino mentality. Eventually the house is going to win out kind of thing with how many contracts are out there. And <clears throat> I don't know, it, to me, it makes sense. And if I'm a player, I think I'd like it better too. Yeah, definitely. Jeff Silky in the chat said love was 11th in passer rate. Almost. Um, that's cool though. Cause that's, that's higher than I thought, you know, obviously it shows you that was a historic second half of the season and those, those final nine games, whoo. He was as good as anyone, but what do you think about uh, escalators and contracts, Tim? I, you know, I, I, me personally, I think you know players shy away from it because they just want that guaranteed money, and it doesn't hurt either that the agents are in their ear going, "Hey, let's get the guaranteed money." Right? The agents want every single dime they can get up front right now, right? But that's that's the culture we live in, right? Yeah, I mean, it'd be nice if NFL contracts were guaranteed, and we wouldn't have to deal with that kind of stuff but um no i i like this um i think it it benefits younger players you know when you're on the the rise in in your ascent in your career um you know having these kind of incentives but i think when you hit like you know the peak and then you're kind of on the downswing of your career having mm -hmm. an incentive based contract is probably a little less beneficial to a uh, an aging veteran um but I'm also a guy who thinks we should sign Jordan Love to a, you know, 25 year contract and <laughs> give him whatever he wants. So, um, no, this is cool. And uh, I like this tweet. It looks like uh, looks like a Culver's receipt when uh, when we go to Culver's and order too many cheese curds here. Like <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, do they not have like a more professional way that they could? Because you obviously he took this right from the NFL side, I'm sure. Sure. Or, He's or, probably trying to cram it all into the tweet. That's that's why he, he yeah. shrunk it, shrunk it down. Hilarious, man. It does kind of look like a CVS receipt or something, but, but <laughs> there you go. So again, uh Dane Stromstadt, member of the PTA posse over on Patreon. Appreciate the uh the question there. And that's how we're gonna continue to incorporate that group. Uh, again, this is just a perfect example, like Jacob was saying. Never seen these numbers, never knew all the details. And because a listener asked, we all learned together. Pretty cool. So um, if you guys uh, are interested in joining the PTA Posse over on Patreon, just click on the link in the description of this video, and that'll send you over there where you can get yourself uh, um, signed up basically to uh, any Patreon member that we have over there, um, a part of it. can be the the smallest uh, group there, you know, as far as the, the uh, contribution. We're going to put you in. Drawings moving forward for autograph memorabilia. We got an autograph Paul Herning jersey coming up here. Also, uh, the, the, ne the next 30 people that join our Patreon also get free access to Emilio's OnlyFans for the next 30 days. <laughs> um, it's just him and his race car bed and a lot of oil. But it's, uh, <clears throat> oh my say God. It's worth it. <laughs> and yeah, if you sign up on the <laughs> you sign up for the mid tier. The mid tier uh, there uh, on Patreon, he'll actually let you reorganize his uh, cardboard box castle too. So <laughs> you can uh, remodel that for him. But you gotta put it back though, otherwise. Poor Emilio, man, can't defend himself. He's sleeping right now in that race carpet. So. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> that's right. Nightmare fuel. I agree, Prince. Completely agree, buddy. All right. Um, so Jacob, one of the things you sent me was um about kamari lassiter right and uh you sent this over from usa today touchdown wire um <laughs> packers pick uh as i packers picked as ideal landing spot for georgia cornerback kamari lassiter now a few weeks ago he was getting mocked to the packers quite a bit uh he being kamari lassiter so if we were to kind of look and see where he sits on most of these uh let me set this down real quick on most of like not the mock drafts, but the consensus big boards. Let's see if that's kind of within range or not. OK, let's go to which would you rather see the 33rd team, the consensus big board, PFF or my board? Which would you rather see there? Well, Jacob, I've got all of his PFF details. So on PFF, he's ranked 37th overall. So if you want to maybe pull up the 33rd team or um, yeah, consensus or just any other database there. Got it. All right. 37th overall PFF, which is their eighth overall cornerback. Got it. So 37th for PFF. Right here is the 33rd team. Let's scroll down and see if we can find our boy, Kamari Kitchens, Kamari Lassiter. There we go. All right. Um, so he's 35th right there in that same ballpark, right? Um, he's the seventh best corner. So it looks like they got him one corner higher. 
according to the 33rd team. Um, Kamari Laster, three-year junior, cornerback out of Georgia, six foot 186 with a grade of 6.6. As we pointed out before, on the grading scale, a 6.6, a 6.5 to a 66 is a lower end starter. So they see him as starting caliber at the cornerback position. And let's kind of click on it and uh let's look at the scouting report here real quick since uh, a lot of people were kind of connecting him to the Packers here recently. So um yeah, 35th overall, seventh uh, at the position, 66th grade. Uh he's uh from hometown is Savannah, Georgia, so he's from the south. Uh Lassiter has the speed and athleticism. Uh, speed, athleticism, and transition skills to be a solid cover corner, but he will need to work on his ball skills and get stronger to be more effective in press if he wants to be an all-around starter. That sounds like another Georgia corner we took, does it not, fellas? Needs to work on his ball skills. Tim, you, you, who'd you think of right then, buddy? I thought of Eric Stokes Jr. <laughs> a little bit, just a little bit. And right. then when you see that little – gets a little handsy in, in press coverage – um, you know, Halfley system, I mean, we're not going to play press all the time, but we're certainly probably going to see more press than we saw in the yeah. last few years. So that's a bit of a, a concern. Play strength, wiry frame, you know, that those type of things you can, you know, come into your own as a pro. You can put some muscle on and, you know, add a little weight, get a little stronger. Um, so that's that's correctable. All of those are really correctable. Um, I right. guess it, it just depends on, you know, the potential that they see. But I it, I wouldn't be completely shocked if the Packers uh you know drafted Lassiter. Uh he he wouldn't be my first pick um at well, corner but certainly could be a fit I think. Let yeah. me uh let me just real quick just pump him up cuz I kind of breezed over his PFF grades here. So this year he was at 85.4, year before was a 73.0. <clears throat> his first year was 76.8. <clears throat> Each one of those years he had decent snaps. Last year was 600 snaps plus. Uh, more like 700 the year before was 700 plus the year before was almost 200 he only had uh one bad game where he graded out last year it was the first week otherwise he legit had good games every year he only allowed two touchdowns over his whole three years at zero yet uh, last year he allowed a 48.7 rating he had a rendy grade of 70.5 and a coverage grade of 87.2 so the dude balled out so that would suggest his tape was great right that's yeah. that's what that's suggesting there um, there's got to be a reason here. He's 53 on my board, okay? And the main thing that drug him down was his 2022 grade, all right? And uh, also, he did not get a bonus for the RAS. And if I'm looking at this correctly, and I could have the information in wrong, I want to double-check here on uh, Math Bomb's RAS site. Um, Kamari Laster, yeah, his RAS was a 6.2. So, with that being said, I don't think Goody has ever drafted. I don't think that's right. Is that not right? I don't know. I just I think I read an article that had way higher than that. But let me double check. You talking about RAS? Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm on Math Bomb's site right now. So yeah. the, if if it's wrong, the source got it wrong. So <laughs> he's the guy who created the RAS. So um, that his website is showing. I can pull. Actually, let me pull the card here. Let's take oh, that. No. Let's take a look at it. Let's let's look at his uh his card here a little closer. Let me grab a screen grab real quick. So Kamari Lassiter. Let's get it in here into the database. That's interesting because if that's the case and they did take him at 25, that would be the first time Goody's ever taken a first round pick with someone less than like an 8.3 RAS, right? Yeah. So Here's his RAS card, his composite size grade, 6.64 for a height, weight of 186 was a 4.1, so that drug it down a bit. His 40-yard dash was a 4.64, 40. Um, that's a, a, for a score of 2.73. His 20-yard split was 2.69 for a score of 2.98. A 10-yard split of 1.58 uh, for a score of 6.21. His agility grade is absolutely elite. Shuttle, uh, 4.12 at 8.38, and a three-cone at 6.62 for a score of 9.80. So what you're seeing is top-end speed, straight-line speed, that type of thing, 20-yard split. 10-yard split, a little bit quicker out of the out of the jump, but not so uh, not so quick at the 20-yard mark and then obviously the 40 altogether. So, um, yeah, so that is accurate. His RAS is a 6.24. Um, 
which is uh, – it's interesting because his strengths here on the 33rd team, acceleration and closing speed, yes. right? Um, so it's one of those things. We know that we tend to put the underwear Olympics on the back burner, and we key more on the tape, more on the grades. How did they play on the field in full pads, right? Um, but if you're going to go off precedent, and I think we would be doing a huge disservice if we didn't, um, like I said, to the best of my knowledge, Goody has never draft, drafted anyone in the first round with an RAS of less than 8.3, I believe so. 8.3, 8.6, definitely in the 8. So let's just say 8, anyone less than an 8, right? So um, going to be interesting to see where he falls. And here's the thing, too, um, with people saying, hey, this is a guy that they're interested in. Will he be a rate, uh, available at 41, right? That's the question, too. If you take him at 41, obviously we took Jaden Reed with an RAS less than 8 last year in the second round. And that worked out pretty good. Um, I've got Kamari Lasseter on my board at 53. So 41 would be a lot easier to stomach than obviously 25 would. So. Yeah. I, I, was, I was almost thinking like <clears throat> I'd only want him if he fell to like 58 or something like that crazy. So Right. Yeah. Yeah, 58 would be perfect. You know, that's good value there according to my board. But, again, if you're just going off of the 33rd team and, uh, and what they believe, you know, they had him significantly higher, right? Um that, that's I guess why I wanted to bring it up because it was interesting. I've seen him mock to us now like five times randomly in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Last week specifically. And in my head, I kept just being like, I don't feel like I just don't feel like he's a good fit. I mean, he is <clears throat> if you see where he's you know, he's ranked right between guys that we love, like Colson and Gene and Barton, but I just don't see yeah. the value. Right. Got the same exact grade, same exact grade as Cooper DeGene. And uh, like you say, Graham Barton, right? So um let's see. So PFF has them pretty close to the 33rd team. Let me take a quick gander here at the consensus big board. Let's see what the consensus is saying about him. Um, I think I seen him in here earlier when I was looking. Let me just go to save us some time. Let me hop real quick over to cornerbacks. Kamari Lassiter. They have Kamari Lassiter in the 43 spot, so right in between where the 33rd team has him and where I have him on my board. So that's probably pretty realistic. They got him mocked. Uh, to the Pittsburgh Steelers at 51. So I can see that. Yeah. So now I'm glad you pulled that, Jacob, because that's a, that's an interesting topic for sure. One of those names that keeps kind of getting tossed around a bit and, uh, or they're smoke or fire typically, you know? It seemed like one of those names that we wouldn't know, you know, or it would be one of them where you're like, oh, come on, who is that when we draft them? And now, unfortunately, right. I don't like the more we dive into these guys, uh, I hate the fact that we probably will, or I know that some of us will you know, have favorites and non-favorites. So when we draft some of these dudes, some of us are going to be like, oh, no. God damn. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But, um, so something else that you had pulled too here. Tim, do you got anything to add to, to Lassiter there, man? I, I I, mean, I think you pretty much said it too, right? Don't like him at 25. Oh, gosh, no. Um, day three pick maybe, you know, depending on how things happen. If he falls, you know, I wouldn't hate the pick. I would hate the pick early, though. That right. for sure. And uh, if Goody saw that RAS score, I don't think we got much to worry about. So, Right. And when we say RAS on here, guys, obviously we don't think that Goody is pulling information from the RAS website. We think that they have their own athletic profile that they put together that's similar to RAS. Right. They could so, have him a little higher or a little lower for all we know. Right. That's what happened with Jaden Reed last year. You know, the rumor was that he came in and worked out for him or whatever, which was weird because he wasn't a top 30 visit. So I'm, I'm assuming that was just outside of that. Um, but they said they had him a lot faster than he did um, at the combine, which that's not going to completely change his RAS score. The main thing that hurt him was his size, he being Jaden Reed. So um, still came into the league and just absolutely balled out. Um, so, Jacob, you sent another article to me here, and I apologize for the ads, guys. There's nothing I can do about it here. But this is something we've talked about, and we've caught a little bit of, a little bit of flack for when we're talking about potentially drafting a defensive lineman early, whether it's in the first round, second round, third round. And we always say that, hey, look, you know, Kenny Clark, contract year, they may re-sign him, they may not. We got to make sure that we got a strong defensive line for the future as he's approaching 29 years old, if I remember. So here's an article that Jacob found from MSN that says Packers build for future without Kenny Clark in a four-round mock draft. Okay, it says the Green Bay Packers have a decision to make on Kenny Clark's future. 
Clark has one year remaining on his contract and is entering his age 29 season, having played 123 games for the Packers. Are they willing to make him one of the highest paid defensive linemen in the NFL? He already is, actually, on a deal that will go into his 30s. They absolutely could, but it's no guarantee. Um, what if Green Bay decides to move on from the three-time Pro Bowler? The team is investing resources in rebuilding the defensive line, including using a first-round pick on Devontae Wyatt two years ago. The Packers still have time to decide, but the upcoming draft could give us a clue. They have done their homework on the defensive tackle class, and if they add a lineman early, it could indicate they're preparing for a future without Clark. That's how this four-round mock draft plays out. So I'm not going to read the rest of the article, but we're going to talk about the mock in itself. So in round one, something else we've caught hell for here on this this here uh, joke of a show is uh, – Taking offensive linemen in the first round, you guys know with Jake last night, we did a mock, or yesterday rather, I took Amarius Mims with the 25th pick. Um, he's 21st on my board. I got him at 25, great value there. In this mock, they took Troy Fontana from the tackle from Washington. Jacob, what's your take on Troy Fontana, if you've got the PFF or what have you? Um, let's uh, let's kind of dive into him. Let's dive into these four picks in this mock that they did. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, I think Jake actually ended up taking him with his first pick. And I didn't, I haven't done honestly a lot of research on him until um, yesterday and this morning because I just didn't see us realistically having a shot at him. But if he does fall to 25 for any reason, it would be amazing. Um, mm -hmm. I know what's awesome about you guys talk about RAS scores. This dude is super versatile to the point where I think he had him scaled down to where he's, if he start him at a center, he's a 10. If he's a guard, he's like a 9. Point eight or whatever if he's a tackle it's like a nine seven or something crazy yeah. like that but he's a perfect 10 they might even mention it in this article if you scroll down just a second here but the yeah. Montanu is a guy that if you want to be able to plug and play any one of those you know spots on the line it seems like he can uh oh right there yes yeah. nine six two out of ten if he's a if he's a at tackle nine nine four if he's a guard and a perfect 10 at center that's yeah, you love it dude. yeah as uh as billy bob once said in uh and uh, what what was the name of the movie again? He said, "I give it a 10. Right? You guys remember that? You do? Yeah. Dude, Some kids in here are going, "I've never seen that movie." Check with movie. your parents, please. Check with your parents. That's when one we of my were in, when we were in high school, right? When we were your age, there were things that were considered, "Eh, that ain't bad. It's appropriate. They'll be all right watching that." Nowadays, whoo, I don't know, Tim. What do you think, man? I don't want your life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but uh, I, mean, I every think grown, every football fan over the age of 18 needs to watch that movie. I'll just say that. Go ahead. Yeah, there you go. For sure. <laughs> I just think this is interesting how in the article, you know, they're talking about, we're talking about moving on from Kenny Clark and, you know, with the first pick in the draft, we take a tackle. And then we follow it with apparently looks like Max Melton there. At yeah, 41. we're gonna get to it. <laughs> so um, this this is uh, kind of what provoked me in our draft with Jake yesterday to uh, to go with uh, Jerzan Newton uh, right away at twenty five. Him being on the board makes sense in this scenario. Um, you know, you let Kenny play one more year, and uh, you transition over to uh, another stud uh, on that D line. Um, so I, I think that's uh, also something that can throw off the rest of your board, though, um, going D-line early, depending on how the, the draft plays out. But uh, I would think that if that's the plan, I would I would feel comfortable, you know, round one or two making that that decision with the D-line. Um, otherwise, you know, I think you do look at another three year deal, possibly for Kenny or something like that. So. When you see who they get here in a minute, I think you're going to go, okay, all right. Yeah, I was I'm excited say, for you to see it for sure. I, uh, I cheated I cheated ahead and, and read it. Go ahead, Jake. I was just going to say to to mimic that, obviously, I'm the one who brought the article, so I know how it will end up. But one thing that we got out of our study we did with Jake yesterday um, is that we need to go at least tackle or cornerback in the first two rounds. It doesn't necessarily matter what order, but you got to get your tackle early and you got to get your high-end corners early. So once you see the way this draft shapes out, I think you'll be happier. But yeah, I do agree that um, it's a little bit wonky. It looks almost clickbaity until you scroll down and see the way it finishes. So yeah. patience, patience, <clears throat> patience. Um, so when we did that exercise yesterday, the mock draft, I would have taken Fontenot, but he wasn't available. And the reason being is the way we did the draft was I just told Jake, let me pick last 
but is basically we were all picking for the Packers. But the 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 twist in this little exercise was we did a snake draft, like meaning, you know, whoever went first had to go last the next the next round or what have you. So if one of the other guys, whether it was Jacob, Tim, Emilio, or Jake, took a player, we weren't allowed to select that player. So you're actually getting, you know, you're getting <laughs> It was just a really interesting way to show you kind of worst case scenarios for when you got to your pick if you were picking last or if you were picking first. Like, hey, here's here's how good it could potentially be. Here's how bad it could potentially be. And it's giving you kind of a net of four to five picks where you can go, okay, these are probably a pretty good guesstimate of four to five picks the Packers could take at each of these picks. So Troy Fontenot on my board is 19. Obviously, he wasn't available because Jake took him. I had Amarius Mims at 21. So it wasn't like we were just going, well, we got to have an offensive line. It was hands down the best player available at that he time. Block. Vertical boards. <laughs> he can. <laughs> Correct. Um, so just a quick glance here, too. Let me do this. I want to see where the 33rd team has him. I won't share it on screen, but I'll let you guys know because these are names that keep getting mentioned. Um, Fontana, they had him at 22. So well worth the 25th pick there, according to the 33rd team. And then the consensus big board, if we go to tackles, has Fontana in the 20 spot. So there you go. That's how they had him. Um, I think that's a solid pick if you go with Fontana there with the 25th pick based off all the information we have our hands on. So, um, all right, let's move on to pick number two. I know there's going to be a lot of Packer fans get excited about this. It is in round two, pick 41, they took Max Melton cornerback out of Rutgers. And this is what we talked about, where if you don't take a corner in the first round, you're missing out on that first wave of corners. Max Melton is one of those prized possessions in the second wave of cornerbacks, according to most boards. So with Max Melton going there um, at 41, Tim, what do you think about that pick there? Max Melton out of Rutgers. Uh, one of the, I think he was clocked as the fastest guy at the senior bowl, if I remember correctly. It looks like he has an RAS of 9.10. Um, not my first choice at corner, but – realistically my second or third for sure and i think uh like you just alluded to he's definitely the uh the darling of that second round early second round possibly i mean we've had some some mocks i've seen him go as high as 88 91 um in some of these picks but i think if you take this route if we go o line or even if we did go d line uh in the first round and max is on the board at 41 i it does seem like doug's saying here it does seem a bit high but um, mm -hmm. I think so is the ceiling for a guy like Max. There might not be a ceiling. So grabbing him at 41 is not not the worst move. It might it might be a little shocking, but um, you know, I, I understand. I see where they're going here with this. Yeah. Um on my board, I've got him sitting, and this is gonna shock everyone. Keep in mind how I built my board, right? Max Melton caught a lot of steam after the season. On my board, he's 177. Jacob, how does PFF see Max Melton? Do you have that information there handy or no? I don't, don't have it in front of me. I can pull it up. I got it right here. What do you think about Max Melton as I pull that up, man? Yeah, I, I like him a lot. Yeesh. I mean, he's, he's my top five, but he's definitely going to be more at four or five to me. So 41 is a little rich for my blood. Um, but one thing is we've realized that when the Packers do like a player, they're not afraid to kind of – I mean play walker in the first i mean if they like a player they're they're willing at the second round pick to me doesn't seem like anybody's really off the board if they really do like a player and if they had a who knows what grade they had on max and if there is um that much of a need for it i think they might pull the trigger i just i don't see it happening at 41 i just don't i agree um pff agrees too they've got him in the 80 spot on their big board so this is Max Melton, the reason he was so low on my board, okay? Let me give you just a couple examples here. 2022, he was the 385th graded cornerback in 2022 in college. In 2023, the 280th. So he rose 100 spots, but still there were 279 corners that graded out better than him, right? Now what changed there? The senior bowl? And his athletic ability, kind of what was clocked, and then obviously the combine. So this is a perfect example of why I would have someone down around 177, and there's some 
you know, websites doing mock drafts saying, hey, I can see Max Melton at 41. Jacob, I think you make a great point. We never know what Goody's going to do, man. There's going to be two or three in this draft that we we have to use the snoop drop of. Who? It's going to happen, man. It's going to happen all day long. So that brought him down on my board. Also, the other thing that brought him down on my board, um, was the 33rd team. When I took this information, he was 131 on their board at that time. So um, that drops him way down as well. And then, of course, um, the consensus big board, when I took the info, he was 88 at that time. Now, the RAS, he did get the RAS bonus as well. So I don't like Max Melton at 41, but I wouldn't rule anything out. So, um, all right, so that is round two. Now, Tim, you ready for it? Drum roll, please. We need us a we need us a drum roll sound box, but we need we gotta yeah, get one. There we go. That, that's that's good. good. Jacob loves that one. So yeah. in round three, we finally address the defensive line uh need or potential need, and that is Mr. Chris Jenkins at 58. I got excited about that, man. Um, when I seen it because we were talking about it in early in the process and it's one of those guys that I feel like is arguably the most well-rounded defensive lineman in this draft, meaning, you know, you got guys that are great pass rushers on the interior, but their floor is kind of low for the for the run game. You got others that are really high in the run game, their floor and the pass rush is low. Chris Jenkins, in my opinion, is right there in the middle. When I broke down the top four or five interior defensive linemen, he had the high, he had the second highest pressure rate, if I remember correctly. He also had the second highest, um, whatever you want to call it, tackle grade. I, I did a combination of tackle grade and uh, and what they call run defense stops, where you stop them at the line of scrimmage or behind. So he finished second in both of those categories, which made me go, this dude's pretty well-rounded. So they take Chris Jenkins at 58 out of Michigan. Um, we'll go around the horn with that. We'll start with you this time, Jacob. What do you think about Chris Jenkins at 58? Would you be okay with that pick, man? I'd be fine with that pick at 58. Um, I definitely think that there's other things that we need. So I I would much rather see us go somewhere else positionally uh, in the first three to four picks and maybe try to snag a guy at the you know later fourth or fifth rounds. But um, I wouldn't be mad. I mean, they, talk, they, they go on to talk about how we, we've definitely drafted mm-hmm. interior linemen, but they're more kind of geared for – pass rush um carl brooks and wyatt in years past how they had almost 10 sacks in the last few um uh last 16 games or whatever i believe or yeah last year so i i'm okay with it in theory he's a big run stopper um which is what we need but i just feel like that the positional value is a little lacking right now so and then uh, this is another reason why i'm captain trade down at 25 because we could have another extra pick or two in the top 100 that I could see us throwing at a Chris Jenkins or a Christian Boyd or something like that. And then I totally am fine with it because it's like, we got extra money. Definitely. I love this pick, man. I'm, I'm over the moon about it. Uh, I, I, I seriously, I love everything about it. Like on my board, he's 39. So we're getting the 39th best prospect at 58. I would be running that card up there. Um, Tim, what do you think about Chris Jenkins? out of Michigan there at the 58 spot if he's still there in the second round. Oh, absolutely. I'm with you, Clayton. I think it's a good pick. Um, it does seem, I don't know, it, it seems a little little shocking to me that we would we would even get him there. Um, I agree, yeah. You know what I mean? But, hey, if it, it if he's on the board at 58, I, I think it's uh, there's worse picks you can make. Um, he's, I mean, after Jerzan Newton, he's probably my second favorite. Uh, D lineman in this draft. So nice. I like the pick another, another Michigan boy. Let's go. Yeah. And he comes from just, as I said on Twitter, a long line of ass whoopers. Mm-hmm. Um, that dude, his dad, you know, Chris Jenkins played for the jets, great interior defensive lineman. His uncle, uh, Colin Jenkins played for the Packers, great interior defensive lineman can get after the pass or two. Um, I like what D Man says here. Jenkins is nicknamed the Mutant for a reason. LOL. I'd do a backflip if he's a Packer. So mm-hmm. his nickname is the Mutant. Boy, you talk about some good photoshops there if he if he does get oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you'd have Hercules, the Mutant, Bane, Gary. Oh my God. Yeah. Come on, dude. Let's go. It don't, Just it don't get any awesome in the <laughs> <laughs> So on my board, like I said, I have him in the 39 spot. Um and the reason being is in uh, 2022, he was the 60th best defensive lineman the year before he comes out in the draft. That's pretty phenomenal, like or two years, I should say. 
uh, before he comes out in the draft. He's the 60th uh, best defensive lineman. Um, he was at the time 44th on the consensus big board. He was 61st on the 33rd team big board. And then when you look at the PFF grades specifically, um, Chris Jenkins in 2022, an 80.7 grade, like I said, 60th best defensive lineman. And then in 2023, 82.7, the 23rd highest graded defensive lineman. So 6'3", 305, he has all that size you need. He's only 22 years old. This feels like, I mean, I'm with you, Tim, at 58. I'd have a hard time believing he's there at 58. If they wanted to take him with the 25th pick, I'd be okay with it. If they wanted to take him with the 41st pick, I'd be okay with it. So um, he's just that. I think he's that type of player. And, again, that's just based off of my board, too. So 39 spot, I could see it being worth it, him being in the green, because it's a position of tier one importance. Now, let's back up for a second with our mock drafts with Jake yesterday. Um, when we were talking about, you know, on here, Kamari Lasseter, all these guys, um, I talked about Amarius Mims in the first round. Do you guys have your draft in front of you by chance? Right uh, here. Yes, I do. Right, look, you there. there. Actually there. slept with it last night. Um, <laughs> I was going to get it framed. I didn't have time to get to the store. Sorry. <laughs> so, again, I took Amarius Mims at 25. He was 21 on my board, so great value there. At 41, I took Tyler Newman. He was 32 on my board. So. You took Tyler Newman? I no took, way. Can you imagine that? At 41, <laughs> I took safety Tyler Newman to play alongside Xavier McKinney. Uh, Jacob, who'd you take in the second round, bud? <laughs> uh, Tim laminated his, apparently. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Princess. Uh, what did you uh, in the first pick? I took uh, offensive tackle JC Latham, who fell quite a ways. So, mm. I like it. So, JC Latham on my board is 14th, dude. So, if you hadn't taken him, I was going to be in a pickle there. I was going to be having to take uh, potentially another tackle. Could you imagine if I took a Marius Mims at 25 and then JC Latham at 41? I would have got raked over the coal. So, thank you for that, Jake. Appreciate you. Uh, Tim, who'd you take with the second round pick, man? 41. Uh, Second round, 41, I took, um, let's see, uh, Christian Haynes out of UConn. Nice. I went, I went O-line, yeah. That's solid, man. That is solid. Christian Haynes is 27 on my board. So that's a great pick there at 41. All right, now, um, 58th pick, which is what we're talking about here. They took Chris Jenkins. We all love that pick. I ended up going edge defender Braylon Trice. A um, little bit, he, he came out a lot lighter than he played at. I think they said he dropped like 25, 30 pounds is what Jake pointed out. So he's coming in at like 240 or 250, which kind of makes me think, is he showing scouts? Is he showing NFL teams, hey, look, I can play Sam. I can play a little stand-up if I need to, or I can put that weight on and play on the edge in the 34. Um, he was 26th on my board. I got him at 58. I love that pick. I know a lot of people are going to hate it. I'm thinking – J.J. and Igbari is going to be out for a good chunk of the year. Um, Preston Smith, there's a good chance you move on from him next year. If you do move on from him next year, then you're going to have LVN, Rashawn Gary. Remember when we had Preston Smith, Zadarius Smith, and then you had Rashawn Gary behind them kind of rotating in? Imagine a Braylon Trice rotating in behind those two guys, you know, and you – the time is going to come where we move on from Rashawn Gary eventually, right? He's young. He's he's under a new contract. It's going to be several years, but you'd have a guy in place to kind of take care of that. So I took Braylon Trice again at 58. He was 26 on my board. Who did you take at 58, Jacob? I took cornerback TJ Tampa out of Iowa State. And that's the one that I remember us talking about. It kind of caught me off guard a little bit because he's a little lower on my board. Um, I've got him in the 80 spot, but like you pointed out, Jacob, you you love the way he plays aggressive, right? You feel like we don't have enough of that in Green Bay. That's correct. Yeah. So uh, he was the 33rd graded cornerback. Is that is that true in 2022? Let me pull that up real quick because this kind of – and I'll get to yours, Tim. This kind of feels like Goody last year with Jaden Reed where, you know, you look two years uh, before and uh, mm -hmm. he actually played well. Yeah, looky there, 83.1 in 2022 so that might be one of those players you never know goody kind of goes back and says hey had a great year before his draft stocks down he's going to drop we would have had a grade on him here if he'd come out last year let's take him now so that's interesting there uh tim who did you take at uh at 58 uh 58 linebacker junior colson let's go you and don't even tim me had a good draft. Draft. he did man tim crushed it dude can you list off your draft again real quick tim uh, i took Jerzan Newton at 25, Christian Haynes at 41, Junior Colson 58, 
I took cornerback DJ James out of Auburn at 88. Yeah. And then I took safety Cam Kinchins at 91. Wow. Yeah. Right. That's a solid draft, dude. Yeah. yeah, I had Junior Colson at 52, and this is with the 58th pick. So that's perfect. Perfect setup there, man. No doubt about it. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and finish this article as we're approaching the 50 minute mark here with the 64th pick. So I guess they did some trading. Is that what happened here, gentlemen? Yeah. I, see, weird. I hate it. I hate it when people do this because it's like you're never going to be able to guess the trades, you know, and it really right. everything. But anyway, well, so right. in this one though, they trade up with Kansas City, I believe, which seems a little bit realistic. The way that I kind of think this may be a little bit realistic, I've seen people at first. Cole Bishop just didn't really he didn't grade out particularly well with PFF. When you look at his measurables, he is kind of an athletic freak. He was a 9.88 out of 10, which was the highest relative athletic score of any safety in this draft. I could see him. They were, they're saying here if he's still available at the bottom of the second round, you could see Goody using one of those extra picks we had to move up. Uh, in this instance, they did it with KC. Grab a guy that I've seen a lot of people comparing him um, to Harrison Smith, and apparently he is pretty well-versed playing in that box and playing in the slot corner. So. I can see it being a maybe. Yeah, like you said, that's that's a spot where Goody is willing to trade up right in the second round. That's something we've seen in the past. So um, uh, set second to third round, he's not willing to – or he's not uh, shy about climbing up. I'm trying to find him on my board here because I know Greg Cosell loves Cole Bishop. I mean, it's like one of his favorite safeties in the draft. So um, yeah, D-Man says – there he is. That's actually Greg Cosell's burner. Uh, Cole Bishop is my safety number one all day long. I have him in the 158 spot, um, which is obviously significantly lower. When this happens every year, too, Greg Cosell talks, I listen, I go, all right, I've, I've, there's something I'm missing here, right? What brung him down was his PFF grade, all right, for last year. So if I go to Cole Bishop here at safety, um, They've got him in the 120 spot on PFF, but his grade last year was 65.6, yeah. and he was the 520th graded cornerback. So he- 65%. 65%. <laughs> that's what we- I love it. As I'm reading, I forget about that, dude. That's 65.6, 520 out of 852. The year before, 75.5, 139 out of 785. And then in 2021, 62.8. So to me, I just it's too much of a risk there. But obviously, his size and athleticism is what everyone is just raving over. Uh, Cole Bishop is six foot two, 207, according to PFF site. And one of the things that that Greg Cosell specifically talked about was he can play, he can play your quarter safety. He can come down and play in the box. He can play post safety. Um, he can play man like he can play man coverage, man match principles if you need him to. Like he was really, really impressed with his tape. And again, we always say PFF isn't everything. If you had to make me choose between Greg Cosell and PFF, I'm choosing Greg Cosell ten out of ten times. That dude has watched so much football. He knows exactly what he's looking for, especially at the safety position. Um, I'm going to keep my board the way it is because I, I don't want to shuffle it around. I want to know, all right, is this an accurate way to kind of not predict but understand the value of these players? But uh, definitely someone to keep an eye on there. What do you think about this, Tim? Would you be okay with Cole Bishop at 64, man? Absolutely. I mean, I like I like his measurables. Bigger guy, 6'2", over 200. Um, a lot of the guys that we were looking at are a little bit smaller, um, like – you know, uh, Emilio's guy, uh, DDT, and then you've got Malik Mustafa, uh, Javon Bullard's another guy that comes to mind. Um, I think when you look at the bigger safeties, I, just looking at right now, I mean, it's really Cole Bishop, Jaden Hicks, or uh, Oladipo. Um, so I, I think Cole Bishop would be a great pick um, at 64, uh, although that means we're not getting your guy, Tyler Newbin. Um, but, uh, I think we could do a lot worse. I, you know, it's hard to get a beat on how a guy's going to play in the NFL. Um, and obviously at safety position, whoever we draft is going to see the field at some point. I mean, it's, it's a realistic possibility that we're going to pop someone in there to start next to, uh, McKinney. So, um, time will tell, but Cole Bishop looks like he fits the bill because he's versatile. And, uh, I think we could do a lot worse with that pick. 
Yeah. And, and again, when you look at his versatility too, um, in 2023 alone, he played deep safety, 247 snaps, box safety, 180 snaps, played on the corner 25 times, played in the slot 97 times, and actually technically lined up, lined up as a defensive lineman 38 times, which means he was probably mugging an, an A or a B gap and blitzing there. So pretty interesting there. Eric Sutherland says Emilio's draft crushes look more like bears and Vikings to me. So Emilio <laughs> taking shots. That's why you should always be on the show, Emilio. You gotta gotta you're to take shots on What's that? He said he's got to learn how to defend himself by being here. Exactly. <laughs> And if you go to the live shot of Emilio snuggled up in his bed with his Lightning McQueen stuffed animal, and uh, you know, there you go. He's probably listening right now. Go, I hate these guys. God, I <laughs> hate my friends. <laughs> For those of you who don't know how Emilio got on the show, he was a listener. He used to email me, text me, hey, man, dude, love the show, love the show, this and that. You know, we chat back and forth, and then finally, when I was like, why don't you call him one night? And he called him. I'm like, this dude's pretty funny. So we've got our young. Young member of the of the PTA crew here, dude. I'm telling you, I, he cracks me up every time. You guys think he's good live? He's really harnessed, is he not, fellas? <laughs> <laughs> when we're not live, he is out of control. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, and you love it. I would be, be in your 20s again, right? Right, guys. That would oh, be awesome. God, <laughs> I woke up this morning with both trap muscles just completely knotted up. And I was just like, God, this sucks getting old. Man. <laughs> it sucks so bad. Um, all right. So at 126, people were going, well, how in the hell are they drafting at 126? This is part of the trade up. They took Cedric Gray, linebacker out of North Carolina at 126. OK, um, if we go find Cedric Gray, I know he's fairly high on my board. Um he is in the 64 spot. So that's great value at 126. Cedric Gray is one of those guys that if we get him, um, whether it's the 88th pick or the 91st pick, I'm going to be over the moon with that linebacker um, grab there. But how do you guys feel about Cedric Gray? And then we'll wrap this thing up with uh, asking you real quick. I know you already asked him his. I want to know what yours are too, Jacob. Um, if you got something to say about Cedric Gray, go ahead and say it. If not, tell me who you took at 88-91. Uh, I personally love Cedric Gray, but I don't think that this draft. I I hate this draft. I, I know I, it's my article and all, not my article. But. <laughs> they click and share this on the show. I hate it. <laughs> well, I just thought it was a good example of like because I've heard some people talking about how they want to move around. Um, I think just to me the smartest thing to do is move back, not to move up, not to mess around with. Because right now, uh, somebody in the chat mentioned it. It goes, yeah, Prince. He's like the eighty-eight ninety-one move to get up to sixty-four really takes you. The, takes the meat out of this draft and that's to my in my opinion too is there's a lot of gems in the second to fourth rounds in this pick in this draft and we have a lot of picks in that area so to me just leave it alone use it to if anything move around strategically but this this draft just seems so stupid and discombobulated and to get Cedric Gray at 126 I'd be stoked I don't think it's going to happen but uh in my draft personally I picked which I loved, Kalen Bullock at safety from USC, followed by uh, Cedric Von Prahn, the center slash right guard that we can plug and play from uh, Georgia there. Okay, so at 88, you took Kalen Bullock. Is that yeah. right? All right. So 88, you took Kalen Bullock. Let me find him real quick. Um, I want to see where I've got him on my board. I know we had talked about it live on the show. I've got him at 106, so – not not too bad there, uh, you know, as far as a reach. Um, and then you said with the 91st pick, you took uh, Cedric Von Prahn. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, I've got him at 63. That is a great pick. That was here. a great pick, yeah. yeah. I mean, he was solid last year, dude. If you if you pull it up, I think he was – let me let me pull up his PFF real quick. I, I was going to take him, Jacob, but you picked, you picked right before me and uh, – I had a feeling I'm like, oh, he's going to take Von Prahn, and he did. So I had to pivot, and naturally I pivoted back to the defense and took <laughs> took Hinton. So yeah, he's six four, three ten, um, and uh, last year he graded out of seventy seven point nine. He was the eighth highest graded center, and PFF has him in ninety three spot. Um, if you were to pull his card, he is a true center, no doubt about it. He's played all of his snaps at center, so that would potentially be your Josh Myers replacement if. He continues to play at the level he's playing this year, right? So, um, yeah, there you go with that. So, that was good. That was a fun little exercise. Uh, as far as my final two picks, um, Tim, I know you missed mentioned yours just a second ago when Jacob asked. Say them one more time, 
88, I took uh, DJ James out of Auburn, and then uh, 91 was Cam Kitchens. Gotcha. DJ James, I've got at 70 on my board. And uh, Cam Kitchens, I have actually got a little bit lower than most. I've got him in the 90 spot. Both great value with those picks, no doubt about it. Um, all right, so my final picks, 88, I took linebacker Jeremiah Trotter Jr. Uh, he was 77th on my board. I took him at 88. And it was cool. He, he fell. I, I took a little bit of a gamble knowing that none of these guys were going to be picking before me with the next pick because it was a snake. And sure enough, the uh, the computer generation didn't take him. So that worked out great. And uh, then I took Leonard Taylor at 91 defensive tackle. He's 48 on my board. I got him at 91. So essentially my draft was uh, was kind of built in the trenches there a bit. But we got our starting safety box safety alongside Xavier McKinney. And Leonard Taylor, I really do think he could be one of those guys that you kind of fill that void, which was the whole purpose of this article. If Kenny Clark isn't re-signed next year, you know, what's the plan there? So um, if we do get Chris Jenkins, though, man, I'm going to be over the freaking moon about that, no doubt. So, um, all right, we're at the hour mark. That worked out good. Jacob, thank you for pulling those uh, articles, dude. That was uh, that was a lot of fun just to kind of see. I think we all agree we don't like Kamari Lassiter at 25. And um, – I'm with you, Jacob. I don't want to see them trading up in the later rounds. I'd rather see them maybe trade back early and then stick and pick the rest of the way. That way we can kind of maximize on, on the depth that's in the middle of this. Uh, the depth's going to be kind of gone after the third round, according to Bucky Brooks. Um, when you say it's a deep draft, he said, yeah, it's not going to be deep after the third round. But basically saying there's going to be clusters, what they call bundles, um, there in the second and third round where you're going to be able to get some really good potentially starting quality players there in the second and third round. So uh, interested to see how that unfolds. Jake, you got anything else, man? No. Uh, man, it's already the 7th of April. This just is going to cruise by, man. Before you know it, we got what? Don't we have like uh, people in the building next week? And then we've got uh, – oh, boy, it's getting up here pretty quick, man. And then after that, I mean, it's all seasons go, man. Let's, I'm, I'm excited. We could do maybe some more deep dives like this. I really like doing that. Draft we do with Jake because it gives more realistic scenarios and makes it harder to just go with guys that you you know now everybody's done a thousand mocks and you have your patterns kind of established so it's fun to make it a little bit difficult for yourself so no definitely like, dude I agree it was a, it was a blast hopping on there with him we uh, love doing work with Jake and you guys make sure you check out his YouTube channel as well as his pod uh, it's always draft season podcast here on the Packernet Podcast Network. Um, just uh, excellent work he does. I love just kind of bouncing ideas off of him when he's in the chat here too. Um, Tim, any parting thoughts, Bo? Uh, yeah. There, who in the hell is Mel Kuyper in a way? <laughs> <laughs> we need that clip of Johnny Manziel doing this too at the draft. You know, oh, what I'm talking about where, yeah, or the one where he's in the back and everybody said it was beer in his cup and he was doing the salute. You know what I'm talking about? We need more. Yeah. Of and there's oh. been some funny draft day moments. There's no doubt about that. No doubt about that. Anything, Tim? Sure. Um, just the middle linebacker talk. I we were talking about Cedric Gray. I think uh, he'd be a good fit. I like him. Um, and uh, I mean, just looking at my notes, I've got. I think it's really it's Junior Colson. I'd probably take Peyton Wilson over Cedric Gray, um, mm -hmm. and then uh, probably uh, Edron Cooper or Jalen Ford round out that list a little bit for me. But. Um, you know, I think, and then just to touch on what you guys said about trading back, I think it, it's going to depend on how Goody's prioritizing corner. How, how bad does he want corner in this draft? Because if you trade back, you, it's going to be tough grabbing uh, some of that top tier talent at corner um, in the second and third rounds, I think. Not saying that there's not value there, because there's a lot of, there is, uh, there are corners available. Um, but I mean, some of those bigger names, I don't know if they're going to be necessarily on the board at 41. So if right. you trade, if you, if you dump your 25th, um, I don't know if you're going to get that, you know, top tier corner talent. And that's not to say that Goody's going to take a corner right away, but crazier things have happened, right? Oh, absolutely, man. Yeah. If you look at the corners just real quick and we'll wrap up 13, 14, 17, 28, 32, 34, 35, 36, 38, 46, 55, yeah. 58, 63, 33rd team has them a little more even than most. Um, yeah. But uh, I'm with you, man. If you got a shot with that 25th pick to get one of these top guys, you got to kind of maximize that. Um, if we look at the mock position real quick, um, 
since we were talking about it. According to the 33rd team, the two – hands down, the two best mock linebackers in this draft are Junior Colson and Cedric Gray at 36 and 38. That's how high they are on Cedric Gray. It's the same exact grade. And you see the next mock drops all the way down to 167 with Jalen Ford in a, a 59 grade. So um, that's the difference, man. And, and when there's a low supply and a high demand for something, they may go a little earlier. So um, if you're going to get that that top top tier – Mike linebacker, you're probably going to want to reach a little bit to ensure you get one of those top two guys if indeed the Green Bay Packers board is set up like the 33rd teams. Um, so Cedric Gray, uh, definitely one of those guys that the more I look at it, I'm going, I love Junior Colson, but I'm okay with Cedric Gray too, you know. So might be a little bit easier to get him in the later rounds. Now, obviously, Junior Colson just won a national title there with Michigan, and he was that Mike backer and, and uh, obviously leading that defense. So that that goes for something too, man. You want winners in your program, no doubt. So, all right, we're out of here, guys. Appreciate everybody hanging out with us. Uh, special shout out to the uh, Patreon group. Like I said, uh, Dame Strom, uh, Stromstad, Stomstrad. I screwed it up. Let's pull it up real quick just to give a little, show a little love there. Dane Stromstad with the question there. Appreciate you, buddy. Appreciate everybody in the Patreon group there supporting the show. So we'll be back tonight for PTA Live. Jacob, keep coming through, man. Find us more articles. This was good, dude. This is whether we agree with their mock draft and the trading up or not, man. It's just kind of gets your mind firing in different directions on how the draft may go. So, um, yeah, because otherwise, you know, uh, we'll see what the chat thinks, but it might be fun to do our own little version of what we did with, um, with Jacob. Yeah. We could try to do a full seven round mock. Because with just the four of us, we could try to, mm-hmm. you know, do the snake style. We could pick one. I don't know. Just throwing out. I'm down, I'm down to try it, but I am not volunteering myself to play Jake's role because that looked frustrating. <laughs> he handled it like a professional, but having to keep up with everyone's picks and knowing who to, you know, because you're only doing one mock draft, but you got to know who took who. You just write them down, and then we all keep each other. Uh... Can you do that, Jake? Yeah. Jake? All right, so <laughs> if you, there you go. That's how you uh, – you see how we did that, guys? Clayton said. You call me anything you want, but don't call me I, Listen, we're operating multiple businesses over here, and I got enough headache. I was watching Jake do it, and I'm like, man, I, I have so much respect for this dude. I'd already thrown something to get the screen trying to keep up with this. So, Jacob, <laughs> you'll keep up with it. Now, you got to watch out for Jacob because he'll rig stuff on you, man. He, uh, huh? It's a he little bit of trying. Hit, well, <laughs> It's hard to argue with that logic. So there you go. Um, all right, we're out, guys. We'll see you tonight for PTA Live. If Jacob wants to put that together, we could do that tonight. Tim, you look for some stuff too, man. Look for articles. Anything you come across, you go, hey, that's interesting, thought provoking. We'll put it on the show. So um, awesome. special shout out to everybody. For those of you listening on the pod. <laughs> <laughs> special shout out to everybody. Jacob regrets doing that, I believe. <laughs> he just regrets that I've got control of the soundboard now. He also regrets that the fact that he made fun of my accent, I had to break the beard out on him too. I believe, so, um, yeah. Mandy, first thing she said this morning, hug me when we woke up. You know what she said? You're not really going to get a neck tat, are you? That's what she said. To me. <laughs> nervous about the bet. I said, that bet's a bet. If they I trade up, about that. Yeah, if we get so they if trade up in the first round, and understand, no one's going to try to manipulate this bet here. All right, like this is the bet. If the Packers trade up in the first round. And with that pick, they draft a quarterback. Clayton has to get a neck tat. So, oh, yeah, by the way, Justin. Justin texted me yesterday, too. Justin from Packernet uh, does the graphics for Packernet. Is he going to design the tat for you? This is what he said. <laughs> he said, uh, Goody's a wild card, man. That neck, tat, neck tattoo bet is risky with a bunch of laughing emojis. <laughs> and uh, he said, let me tell you, it hurts like a beep and makes you look like a hoodlum. I know from experience. So there you go. <laughs> All right. Y'all have a good day. Appreciate you hanging out with us. We'll see you tonight. For those of you listening on the pod, thank you for making us a part of your day. As always, let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world. Go Pack Go.